I hope you had a good Christmas. When we were living in Singapore, Sue and I traveled to Canada in January to speak at a conference in Winnipeg. Temperature was about minus five that morning, and I congratulated the congregation in turning up to, uh, on such a, a, a cold and what seemed to me a very bitter uh, day. And there was a ripple of, of amusement uh, ran through the congregation. I, I wondered, what on earth was that about? And uh, afterward I said, well, I was really pleased to see people out in such numbers on such a cold day. They said, cold, this is a heat wave. <laughs> so enjoy the heat wave. We're going to look this morning at John the Baptist. And so we've moved from Christmas, angels, shepherds, to a man who's quite a different character altogether, a very down-to-earth man, and yet a man who exemplified what is, I think, our theme this morning when we look at the principles of this man's life, we discover that for John, the biblical truth is there, that less means more. And perhaps that's a very good lesson for us as we've come out of Christmas when we've probably had more than normal. And John is good for us because he spans a change, the end of an old era. The voice of prophecy has been silent for 400 years and John comes and he begins anew as one who prepares the way for Jesus. But there's a question I'd like to ask you, those of you who, who know this man. What do you think? Is he a role model for us? Is he a pattern, an example? Is, is he someone that we should follow? This is the question. And as you look at his life, you discover someone who is very unusual indeed. He's very unorthodox and radical. Look at his dress. He wears a camel coat and a leather belt, and that's it. He's no fashion model. He's not up there with the trends. Look at his diet. Honey and locusts every day. Can you imagine? And where was he? He was in the desert. But he was popular. People flocked to him. He had a reputation. He was doing something. There was something about John that was entirely challenging and different. And the people were there. They listened. They heard. They, were, they flocked to him. But he was a man who lost. He lost his congregation, as we'll discover. He lost his liberty. He was put in prison. And ultimately, he lost his life. And yet his life is a testimony that less means more. For Jesus, summing up this man, this incandescent flame for God, said this, There is none born of woman greater than John in the kingdom. And what was less for John was more for Jesus and ultimately resulted in the praise, the highest praise, none greater than John. So are we any closer to answering the question, is he a role model, is he a, is he a pattern for us? What is he? Well, let's just look a bit closer. What kind of person was he? He was a world changer. He was a world changer. In one year, he turned the people around. He impacted society. He made a difference. You know, before I was a Christian, I wanted my life to make a difference. I joined all the possible societies that would turn our society around. I marched with CND. I gave my first pay packet to charity. I wanted to make a difference, but... It's only when Jesus is in your life that that really counts. He was a world changer. He was a risk taker. He was unafraid to address the issues of the day. And he was unafraid to challenge people in their complacency and their need to get right with God. You know, I, I was thrilled when I read Averill, uh, sorry, Suzanne Averill's little testimony when she said, I am sold out for Christ. And we see in John the Baptist, a man who is sold out for Jesus. No, he's not, he's not someone that we're going to emulate. I hope you won't go out and uh, sell all your clothes and wear a camel coat and all the rest. 
But I hope he, you'll grasp from this man's life some of the principles, the pattern that God is pleased with in kingdom service. Principles for an effective Christian life where less of self can mean more for God. And there are some key principles here. Here's the first, and I hope you've got your Bibles open at John, John's Gospel. Because we're going to go not just from those first 18 verses, but through the first 30 odd verses of John's Gospel itself. Here's the first principle. Here's what we see embodied in John, the man of God, the man who was described as a burning and a shining light, a man incandescent, for God, and those are the kind of people that can change the world. It's very interesting to me, one of the, one, one of the um, biographies that impacted my life more than almost any other was the, the account of the life of Jim Elliot. Probably that will mean something to some of you, not much to others. But a man who was martyred with others in Ecuador. He'd hardly served a term of service in missionary work, working among a very hostile and aggressive tribal people in the Ecuadorian jungle. He was martyred, his life ended very young. He'd hardly completed a, few, a, a year or two of missionary service. But I can tell you this, his life has impacted more people than I have ever met as I've traveled around the world. We had a, a leadership, we had a leadership training uh, session in OMF a few years ago, and we were asked, what, what biographies have impacted you? And out of about 20, 25 leaders, at least eight had written down his biography, written by his wife, the wife of Jim Elliot. When I was talking to Steve Brady, I said, Steve, tell me what books, what people have influenced your life? And he said, well, one of the most significant was the life of Jim Elliot. My friends, long or short, it doesn't matter. What counts, as with John, one year's ministry, is his effectiveness in the kingdom. I hope all of you want, as we come to the threshold of a new year, to begin with that sense, I want my life to impact for the kingdom of God where I am. Here are the principles, here's the first. The first principle is this, know who you are. Know who you are before God. He's introduced to us in verse six, isn't he? There came a man, just a man, that's all, just a name. That's how he's introduced, a man. A man without a surname. A man who's only known by his nickname, John the Baptizer. Do you know what your nicknames are? John the Baptizer, just a man, yet a man with a very impressive CV. He was born of very pious, prayerful parents. He was born supernaturally. He was a child of promise, that God had promised there would be one who would come to prepare the way for Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit at birth. And is that the secret to his effectiveness? No, I don't think so. Our CVs, our backgrounds, our environments are important, but they're not the most important thing about us at all. Nothing wrong with a good CV. It's a good start to life. But that's not the important thing. The most important thing about you is your relationship to God. And here's a man who's introduced, I'm just a man, a name. But he's a modest man. He's a very modest man indeed. Look at uh, verse 19 of, of John's Gospel, chapter 1. A modest man who is quite unconcerned for his reputation. He's, he's got his ministry going. There are people flocking to listen to him. There are crowds and the leaders of society and the leaders of the religious era come to him and they say, who are you? Who are you? And he's very clear in verse 20. I am not the Christ. And he says that more than once. 
No, I'm not the real thing. I'm not the real thing. So they say, well, are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? Who are you? And he's got a reputation here that he's quite willing to put to one side. What does he say? He says, I'm none of those things. I'm just a voice. I'm just a man. I'm just a voice. That's all. It's not the person behind the voice that matters. I only am a messenger. I'm only bringing a message. You know, when, when the postman brings a bonus check, if you ever get one, or some good news, you've passed your exams, you don't kiss the postman. He's just a deliverer. He's just a deliverer, comes and goes. A man unconcerned for his reputation. He's a very modest man indeed. You know, Gillian Clark, uh, who is the uh, national poet of Wales, was asked, uh, was invited to that position, an honorable position for a poet, a, a, one of recognition. And these are her words. She said, when I was asked to be the uh, National Poet Laureate or the National Poet of Wales, I said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy writing poems to get caught up with a reputation. What an attitude. What an attitude. My friends, is your reputation fragile? Is it something that, is your ego something that gets damaged very easily? Is your reputation something that you fight for, make sure everybody knows, everybody's aware of who you are, what you are? You know, I think I've said this before, in, in some of the times when I've been preaching or have been preaching in other parts of the world, uh, I have been introduced with wonderful, flowery introductions. I just wish my mother had heard. <laughs> But very often I got linked because of who, what I was doing as, as leader in OMF. Uh, I was introduced as the reverend. And because in our family there's a doctor somewhere, I was given the title doctor. So I was often introduced as the reverend Dr. David Picard. Now what would you do in that situation? Uh, because I'm not, none of those. Yet it seemed important to the person introducing the speaker that my credentials were pucker and adequate. But not with John. I'm none of them. I'm just a voice. Who I am, what I am, what I've done, what my reputation is, really doesn't matter. I'm just speaking a message. And that really is crucial. Fragile people with fragile egos cannot serve God well always worried about what other people will think. A modest man, unconcerned for reputation, in fact willing to lose that Christ may gain. He's a man who lost his congregation. In, in John chapter 3 you find John's disciples say to him, Master, the one you baptized, Jesus, people are flocking to him now. And John says, that's fine. If I lose my congregation and he gains, that's really wonderful. I don't know too many ministers. I don't know too many missionaries. I don't know too many servants of the living God who could say with integrity, fine, if people are finding the truth encountering Christ, knowing the real, the reality of the good news of Jesus, then go, let them go. He lost his con congregation. He lost his liberty. He was put in prison for being truthful. And ultimately he lost his life. He was very clear, I am not the Christ at all. Verse 26, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He's the one who comes after me. He's the supreme one. He's the one I live for. He's the one that I'm losing for that he may gain. Listen, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
I wonder if you knew, know, as I only discovered recently, rereading commentaries, that the one thing a slave was never, ever required to do, had to do everything else, whatever the master said, but one thing a slave was not required to do, and that is to undo the laces of his master. And John says, I, I could do that but I'm not even worthy to undo the sandals, the laces of Jesus who is supremely greater than I am. I think of two of our nurses who were working among Malay Muslims in South Thailand. They were leprosy nurses and they ran leprosy clinics and they would take in their hands, in their laps, ulcerated feet. Leprosy has killed the nerves in the feet. They get wounded, they get ulcerated, they, have, they are very ugly and very unattractive. And they would take in their, in their laps ulcerated feet and clean and scrape away and clean the wounds. Those two nurses were kidnapped and taken into the jungle and held for ransom. A ransom that OMF was never going to pay. And although efforts were made to secure their release, they eventually were shot and died in the jungle. But here's the point. Here's the point. Their lives, their willingness to serve, to take the unattractive into their laps, to take the stinking, ulcerated feet and do something for those people became a catalyst for a movement of the Spirit of God among Malay Muslim people turning to Jesus Christ. Here's a man, John, willing to lose his congregation, his reputation, his liberty, and can joyfully say, I'm not even worthy the one I'm serving is so great, I'm not even worthy to undo his shoelaces. What's the second principle? The second principle is very simple. Know, know why you are here. Know why you are here. What are you here for? It's a good question. What are you doing with your life? It's a very good question. Some of you may even be asking that question. What am I doing? What am I choosing? What, what is life about? Where do I fit? What am I here for? And those are crucial questions. And John answers them. He's a, there came a man, verse 6, who was sent from God. A man on a mission. He's absolutely clear. That's what he's here for. He is sent by God, single-minded. There's no, there's no sense here of John making choices for himself. That's what God has called me to do. That's what I am willing to do. That's what I want to do. That's what I give my life to. He was a man sent from God. He didn't volunteer. He didn't drift into this. It wasn't his ambition. He was a man surrendered to the purposes of God for his life. Are you? Are you? Are you really surrendered to the purposes of God for your life? The purposes that God has in mind, the background he, he brought you up in, the experiences that you've gone through, all of which start to shape and make you a vessel, a person that he can use for the kingdom. John, a man sent from God very clear it's very liberating to know why you are here and what you are doing is because God has put you here and God has equipped you God is in control of your life less of self more of God that's the key and I've shared with you before I'm sure the day when having risen in my career in management as a Christian and yet found God getting less and less important in my life. Living with three other single men in London, I came back to the flat where we were, 
came back to my room and I knelt down and simply said to God, I can't make sense of my life. It seems to get drier and emptier and without purpose. And so God, I'm offering you my life for you to do just as you choose, just as you've planned. And it became a complete turning point in my life. He was a man sent from God. He was a witness to Christ. It says here, there was a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness, testifying concerning the light. That's Jesus. So that through him all men might believe. He had one ambition, that is to be a witness, to testify. This is Jesus. And he came to prepare the way. He was known as a man, a voice crying in the wilderness, crying in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. He came to be a witness and to prepare the way of the Lord, the way for Jesus, to remove all the obstacles that got in the way of people engaging with Jesus Christ. That's what he was there for. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? In, uh, in Thailand, where Sue and I lived and served, whenever the king traveled, all the roads were emptied of vehicles. Now, if you've ever been to Bangkok, you'll know how crowded the roads are. In fact, there was a man driving to work, and he saw his friend walking on the pavement. And he said to his friend, wound down the window of his car and said, look, let me give you a lift. And the friend walking said, no thanks, it's faster to walk. <laughs> when the king travels, every road is blocked off. All the side roads are guarded. There is absolutely nothing on the road to impede his progress. I'm told, and I can't vouch for this, but I'm told that the Prime Minister of Singapore never stops for a red light. The arrangements are as his car approaches, so all the lights turn green for him. Unhindered travel. And John says, that's, that's my job. I am here to prepare the way for people to engage with Jesus, to remove anything that would be a hindrance. And for him, to the Jewish nation, he said, you need to prepare. You need to repent. You need to change the way you're living. And you need to be baptized as a sign of your change of heart. You need to have hearts that are clean, hearts that are open to the coming Christ. You know, in my, it, that's in John's generation. What about our generation? What are the obstacles here in this country to people engaging with Jesus Christ? Are we thinking about those? Are we thinking how we can prepare the way to remove some of those obstacles? When we were in Thailand, it was very clear to be a Thai was to be a Buddhist. Therefore, to change your religion, the obstacle, if you change your religion, you are no longer an authentic Thai person. That's an obstacle. And it was important that we dealt with that and we helped to indicate that no, to be a Thai Christian was not to be anything less than a loyal citizen of the kingdom of Thailand. Five years ago, the queen of Thailand was in Chiang Rai and her lady, one of her lady-in-waitings, who was a Christian, passed away. And here's the queen away from Bangkok, the capital, she's up in the north. One of her lady-in-waiting uh, dies and there's a funeral and the queen attends amazing never been known before she attends and she discovers that Thai Christians in their praying and they're praying for the nation and they're, they're praying for the peace of the region and they're praying in such a way for the monarch that there's a realization in her mind that to be a Thai Christian is still to be a loyal Thai. She went back, she went back to Bangkok and she insisted that the new constitution being written, 
should continue to include these, this phrase, freedom to change your religion. God works. What are the obstacles in your life as you witness to people? What are the obstacles there that you need to work on to help people engage with the reality of Jesus Christ? Not their idea of Jesus, not their figment of their imagination, but the real person. You know, it's said of John that his whole life was a sermon. How he lived as well as what he said. Well, I must move on. Here's the third principle. And it's this. First of all, know who you are. Secondly, know why you're here. And I hope none of you will go away with that question unanswered. And here's the third principle. Know your message well. Know what you're here to say. Know what you're here to say. John was gripped by his message. He was gripped by it. It, it. it filled his life and it controlled him. Jesus said of him, you sent to John. You, you religious leaders, you people, you went to John, you sent to him, and he has testified what to? The truth. He was a truth speaker. He lived the truth. He spoke the truth. And he was gripped by the truth. Does the, does the Bible grip you? Does the truth grip you? John had a message to give. He was a lamp, says Jesus, that burned and gave light. Come down in, in, in uh, chapter, chapter 1 again, towards the, the end of the passage we had read. It says, John testifies, or John cried out, not in a whisper, but clearly and boldly, he shouts out the message so that people can be, can hear, listen. No confusion over what he had to say. A man of clear convictions. What was his message? What was his message? Here it is. He says this. Behold, look, pay attention, fix your eyes. Look, here is the Lamb of God, verse 29, who takes away the sin of the world. It's a man who spoke the truth. A man who could say, look, fix your eyes, get a grip. Here is the Lamb of God. And here's a powerful thing. He's saying this is God's provision. Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb. The sacrifice provided by God. And here's John at his best. He's saying less means more. We cannot save ourselves, he's saying. God has provided a gift. Less of your efforts. What can you bring? Says the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. What can we offer God? Nothing but our sinful selves. But here is God's gift, the Lamb of God, the Lamb, the sacrifice, the atonement, the one who can die to take away our sins, provided by God. What do we lose? Nothing in our hands we can bring. We've nothing to offer. What can we gain? salvation Jesus he goes on to say the lamb of god that takes away sin the sin of the world we have nothing but our guilt nothing but our guilt before god to bring and some of us can be crushed by our guilt some of us can be bowed down by our past. Some of us can be bent low by the burdens we carry. And here's John saying, look, here is one who can take away, lift off your shoulders and take it away forever by his death and his resurrection. What do you lose? Guilt, shame, 
burdens? What do you gain? Forgiveness, life, eternal. Jesus said, I've come. I've come that people might have life and life in all its fullness. He said to those busy about their religion, worn out by their religion, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Less of you and all of me. Come to me, the weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come empty. Go full. Less means more. Martin Luther said, you can always be too big for God. You can never be too small. You can have your hands so full of your things that you can't receive what he would give. Less means coming to him as a sinner. And John's message doesn't end there. He says, Christ is the, is the empowerer. He says this, I gave testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on Jesus. I wouldn't have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. John spent his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. He filled with the Spirit at birth. The promise to all who come to Jesus is the power of the Holy Spirit to live for Jesus. Not bumping along the bottom, but living in power. Not living under the circumstances, but living above the circumstances. Here's a man who turned in one year, turned society around. And he points to Jesus, the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and says, that's what you need, forgiveness. You need to have the guilt of your burden taken away and your life renewed and empowered by the incoming Holy Spirit himself. We're going to sing a hymn in a minute. It's a hymn written by a man called Charles Wesley. Wesley, Whitfield were men filled with the Spirit of God who turned this country around, who saw revival in dead churches, who saw outsiders brought to Christ in great numbers, who were empowered not only to evangelize but to disciple and to give the church hymns of praise and worship. They were men like John, who turned many to Christ ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, this morning as we stand at the end of 2013 and as we look into 2014 and we hear the voice of John, I'm just a man. What can God do with a person who says, God, I'm just a man, I'm just a woman, but take me, all of me, none of me. I renounce my choices to myself and I surrender to you. What could God do if not only a man or a woman comes to him in that frame of mind but says, I'm here, God, to do your will. When Jesus lived on earth, he moved in the purposes of God from beginning to end. God has his purpose for you just as he has for me. What could God do with our burdens lifted with lives changed and empowered by the Spirit. Here's what he did for the Wesleys. Listen. Came a note of praise. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. That's John the Baptist. He couldn't stop speaking. Two times recorded in John's Gospel, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Keep looking. He can't stop using that message. And here's another who's touched by the Spirit of God, a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Will you stand with me as we sing this hymn? 
See, all your sins on Jesus lay. The Lamb of God was slain. His soul was once an offering made for every soul of man. Let's stand as the musicians play and sing. Let's see if we can raise the temperature as well as the roof. <laughs>